You say I make you nervous, a tragedy, I'm a beautiful disaster, a reckoning, you wonder how I got this way. What's up everybody? Welcome to my channel. I'm Sunshine. Make sure to subscribe to my channel. Someone took it up and tame oh some things never change, never change. You think What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel. Well, she put out chapter one rachel goes rogue we are going to listen to this together my first time listening it will be why i edit this video but i try not to peek and see what people had to say yet so that it didn't spoil it but i did look at reddit and someone wrote like a whole closed captioning pretty much of the podcast and i read a little bit of that so this is going to be very interesting. Let's just get right into it. Make sure you hit that like button down below. All right, let's go. My name is Rachel Savannah Levis, and I have decided to create my own podcast to get my story out there. It's been a while since all of this stuff has gone down, and I've been quiet this whole time. I know what I have to say is important and it's been a scary decision deciding to do a podcast because I'm really opening that door up again for all of the scrutiny and judgment. But the more I think about it, I feel like I'm almost obligated to myself to stand up for myself. I would rather speak my truth and share my story and be ridiculed for it than just sit idly by and watch this whole season pan out and not get my story across. So that's why I'm doing this podcast. Okay, I'll say it then. You chose not to be on season 11. You chose not to be on season 11 because they were not going to pay you the same amount as Tom and Ariana, who have both considerably been there since season one, all 11 seasons. You have not. And that's how contracts work. And because you thought you deserved to be paid more, that's why you didn't come back. Yes, you might have other reasons as well, but that was the biggest reason out there. All right, let's see what else she has to say. I'm here in a room with a bunch of awesome women. These are my I Heart family members um, who have really taken me in and shown me that it's okay to speak up and encouraging me to really step back into this spotlight. Um, and they really believe in me. So I'm grateful to have them here with me. This is our first episode with you and it almost didn't happen. It was really hard yesterday figuring out, is this the right thing for you to do? It was a tough day yesterday just because I'm trying to decide, like, is this the best decision for me? Um, going back to do season 10 of Vanderpump Rules was very difficult for me. And I've realized that I'm not necessarily cut out for reality TV. I don't know. Like, it just seems like there's a lot of strategy going on with reality TV and things aren't always the way. <sighs> um, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> That's okay. I'm very hesitant to come back to the entertainment industry. There's another world where I close the door on the entertainment industry completely and go live my life um, in nature and do my yoga and Pilates and really focus on my therapy and mental health. But I feel like there's also a world where I can speak my truth and I can get my story out there. And I can also be doing my therapy and Pilates and focusing on my mental health. Um, and that's just where my priority lies right now. Yesterday, I almost pulled the plug on this whole operation just because I'm, I'm really scared. I'm really nervous. I'm, I feel like it's a lot of 
responsibility for me to put out a podcast every single week while Vanderpump Rules season 11 is airing every single week. I have a plan with my therapist to process what we watched on Monday's episode for Tuesday. And then I have the remaining days to come up with what I'll be talking about on my podcast. Um, And I don't want my podcast to be like a response necessarily to what they're putting out there for season 11, because ultimately I'm not a part of it. I remove myself from that situation for a reason. Um, my intention is just to share my truth. Now, I think she has a wonderful plan put in place that she will be working with her therapist along with, I guess, watching season 11. In my opinion, with just situations that I've been through in my life, if I don't want to see something, then I don't have to watch it. And If I don't watch it, then I don't have to know what's going on. And by her watching it, she's still involving herself in their lives and having that opinion in their lives from watching the show about how she feels about things. And clearly, I know that they're going to be resolving a lot of things within season 11 regarding the affair and everything that happened, but that is their journey and she's inserting herself into their journey when in my opinion she should be worried about her own journey. I think she should be moving on and yes tell your story get it out there tell your side all of that but then move on. If you didn't want to be part of season 11 then you don't have to watch season 11 either. I don't see where like she has to watch it to then discuss it on the podcast like I don't get that. To me That is just a way for her to make money and to keep inserting herself. I really think that she needs to be working on her mental health. There's a lot of underlying issues. I myself have mental health issues that I work on every single day. I don't necessarily deal with press and things like that like she does, but I deal with the constant bullshit that comes with putting myself there online and the people have their opinions about me, my appearance, my looks, my way I talk, my attitude, all of that. It happens when you put yourself out there. And I just think that if she really wants to work on herself and be a better her, there are much better things that she could be talking about on this podcast and her journey to fulfilling herself in that sense. I don't know. This is like... I just want the best for her. I've always have. Uh, People make mistakes. I understand that. I still am on Ariana's side with this, that, like, she is the ultimate victim in all of this whole situation. And Rachel needs to move on and develop herself and become who she wants to be and learn from the mistakes that she made in her past to become the best version of herself. And I just feel like this is like opening a wound. The wound like just healed and now you're reopening it. And I know she hasn't had her chance to say her side of the story. She only did on Bethany Frankel and that was like, you know, four parts, but whatever. But this is her way to talk with like nobody else influencing her kind of a thing. And she deserves that right. I just hope that she doesn't harp on it, but we will see as the podcast goes. All right, let's listen more. What would you say is the main reason you did not want to be a part of season 11? Oh, <laughs> uh, the main reason why I didn't want to be a part of season 11 is because oh, I... <sighs> I don't want to be with Tom and I've made the decision to cut Tom out of my life. Going back to film the show, it would force me to interact with him first of all. And I know I'm on the outskirts with all the other cast. So I wouldn't get my story across. i really believe that the girls wouldn't give me the, the time of day to let me open up to them. Um, given my previous history (laughs) with my interactions with them. Um, So because I would be on the outskirts with the cast, it would put me in the same boat as Tom. And 
Tom has a way with his words and he would get back in my ear and I could just, I know I'm not in the place where I'm completely strong enough to be able to resist that. You know, I'm not the risk versus reward. Like it's too risky for me to go back, especially at the most vulnerable state I've ever been in, in my life. So couldn't. Did you at all consider going back? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So going into treatment, right. I, I knew that Tom was not a healthy person for me. I had become the worst version of myself through the seven months of, you know, secrecy and deception and going along with these lies that ate me up. Um, and you know, Part of that is my fault. I chose to put myself in that situation and it was a really bad choice (laughs) and um, I'm suffering the consequences now. But I was still in relation with Tom. We were talking on the phone almost every single day when I went in for treatment and in those months that I was in there, I was debating whether or not to go back to do this show. and. I really, (laughs) I realized that my problem stemmed from these unhealthy relationships. And although I knew that Tom was bad for me and he had violated me and got me into this position, I was still talking to him and still making plans to see him after I got out of treatment. Um, so I knew my my main focus needed to be more on like, why am I doing this? I agree. Tom does have a way with his words, but ultimately they both got themselves into the situation. I also think she is right. Those girls would want nothing to do with her. They don't care to hear her side. And ultimately, the best choice for her was moving on from those friendships. I do think she still can have empathy, knowing her actions were the result of those friendships being broken, and she needs to take it as a lesson and not make the same bad choices in other friendships and even relationships as well. She says that though she knows Tom was bad for her, and Tom violated her and got her in this position, that's the part that, like, it bothers me the most. And maybe I just don't understand why she used the word violated her. Usually when someone says he violated me, that means that that person did something without permission. And I just don't understand. Maybe she isn't saying what really happened, or maybe she's insinuating something happened that, well, has never been said before. This to me is cause for concern. And at this point, with the fact that she has lied about other things before, I know that I'm not the only one thinking, is she making this up? Is she using this word to make it seem worse than it was? Or really, is there something we need to know that we don't that this man did to her? It's not a word that you want to use if you aren't implicating something bad happened. What do you guys think? Let me know down below because that word really bothered me. And why? Why why do you think you're so sort of connected or entangled or addicted to him? It's a very heavy and loaded question. I think there's like multiple factors that play into that. I think I put him on a pedestal and looked up to him in a way. And he validated me in a way that I felt very adored and admired. And I felt valued as a person. But I realized that I have a pattern of putting these guys on a pedestal. And then my friendships suffer because I'm not spending as much time with my friends. It's all about this one person. 
and it kind of like takes over my life. So, and we can go into it more too, because I, we will. Does it make you feel bad about yourself at the same time as you're sort of on this high from those men in your life? <laughs> it makes me feel like I have grown since then, just going into a mental health facility for three months. I, you know, like I was very dedicated to my recovery. Um, and I'm aware of these things now, whereas before it was more of like this subconscious decision-making that I felt like I wasn't in control of my life. Um, so I look back on that girl and I, I feel compassion for her because she was just trying to, she's trying to live and watching season 10 back. I got really emotional because I saw how much I was drinking and how much I was numbing my anxiety and numbing my pain. I went through a breakup with my ex fiance and he, we had a no contact policy, which was great, but we were working together and we were filming together and he brought his new girlfriend who he met three weeks after I ended our engagement around and told me that she was the love of his life. And it really made me feel like what we had wasn't real. So I know I was grieving that relationship and I knew I wasn't ready for another committed relationship. I, and maybe that's part of the reason why I had this attraction to Tom, because I knew he wasn't emotionally available 100% for me. She definitely put Tom on a pedestal for sure. And I think that's why her friendship suffered, because she was lying to her friends, hiding the affair. You couldn't talk about it with your friends, who ultimately are there to help you, to guide you to make better choices. But because they had no idea that was happening, your friendships suffered because of the deceit. I do think the mental health facility helped her, but going forward into a new relationship after going through a lot of learning who you are and things you did wrong, you need to be more focused, more aware. You need to allow yourself to look for different things in men that you might have not looked at before. And it will always be a continued learning process. I can understand her not wanting to be in a committed relationship after James, but going for someone that emotionally is unavailable, that right there is a red flag. And I hope she has learned that is not something she wants again, because it will just be the same results. So you kind of felt like you spiraled in a way after you met Allie and figured out that James was moving on so quickly, right? Yeah, that was the first of it. Um, <laughs> and the social situations I found myself in with the cast members encouraged me to drink even more. Um, and I really needed a therapist in my life to help me like talk these things out. Um, and instead I had Tom and he was always there for me. Um, and so, was he? well, not really. <laughs> yeah. What makes you think sort of as you're describing it, that he was, and now looking back on it, what, what was really going on? Um, yeah, good question. It felt like he was always there for me because we would FaceTime literally all hours of the day, every single day. And he would come over to my apartment and we would, we would just like kick it on my balcony and vent about our filming experience. And we bonded over that 
unique situation of being on a reality TV show and the things that happen behind the scenes that aren't talked about and, you know, viewers don't really know about um, that he understood. And so I felt seen and I felt heard by him. I felt validated. And it just seemed like he was always ready to drop anything to come see me. Do you think it was genuine? I thought it was. I thought it was. Um, And I think, I think there's a part of him that it was a genuine, deep connection. I mean, only he can speak on that, really. But um, I think there was also healing that he needed to do in order to be a more mature adult to handle his relationship because he was telling me that he wanted to break up with her and venting to me about that relationship but then feeling stuck and like he would always tell me that he was actively like breaking up with her and going to the couple's therapy to break up with her and I think I was just too patient with it um I mean, if I could go back, I would do a million things over. But in this specific instance, I feel like I should have really just put my foot down and been like, okay, like you need to decide what you want because you're telling me one thing and your actions are speaking a different story um, and just like completely walk away. Did you? I'm not going to lie. Her nervous laugh is kind of bothering me. And that's just something that personally I think she needs to work on. But it's just some constructive criticism for her. Now, was Tom leading her on? I believe he was in a way. And he was also emotionally fulfilling his issues with Rachel. I think they both understood right from wrong. And to allow it to go on as long as it did is cause for concern and at this point she was already pretending to be Ariana's friend let's be real here and my question is why didn't she just go ask her what was happening between them like why didn't she go and find out for herself like what maybe he was saying to her so that she could have a better understanding what he was saying to her and if it was the same thing There are just questions, and the more that it's being discussed, the more questions we all will have. What questions would you like to ask? Let me know down below. Have you ever considered telling Ariana anything that he told you about what was going on in their relationship and how he felt and everything? Yeah, um, it was definitely uncomfortable um, knowing this in the back of my mind and knowing that she didn't know the extent of it. But that interaction that you saw me speak to Ariana, one of the later episodes on season 10, where I was asking her about her sex life, because Tom was telling me that they weren't having sex and it wasn't existent. And I just was curious to know her side of the story. Like, was that true for her too? Or is he just telling me one thing? Um, I wanted to know, like, is she really attracted to him or is this more like a, you know, glorified roommate situation? Because that's what he was telling me. So I was trying to feel that out and it happened to play out on TV. So I see what it looks like, you know. So when Ariana was standing there telling you that she still found him very attractive, the things that they were working on together, that she loved Tom, she was in love with Tom, why didn't Rachel stop it all then? She felt her out per se. She got answers. Maybe she put the blinders up to continue what was happening, but she could have stopped it all at that point. And at that point, it would have been like, you know, a month, two, three into the affair. 
It still would have been hurtful regardless, but maybe less traumatic for Rachel herself. For all we know, this could have been something that was hidden from the entire world, and we all could have not known about it, and maybe found out later on seasons, you know, down the road, kind of like with Sheena and Schwartz kissing each other, and how we're going to see that in the new season, which I can't believe that happened, but you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand why she didn't stop it all then. She had the opportunity to feel her friend out. Her friend was very much in love with her boyfriend at the time, and she didn't stop it. I mean, obviously, this is just our first episode, so we're just kind of going into it. And we'll break down everything as the weeks go on. But, like, how real was everything? It felt real. It felt very real. But as I look back on it now, knowing what I know now, it was a lot of living in this fantasy and falling in love with a future version of him where he wasn't with Ariana Mm. anymore. How hard is it for you to watch season 10? Uh, It's really difficult. I've only, well, yeah. (laughs) Well, I've seen every single episode, but it was Very hard, especially the earlier episodes. I could see how much pain I was in. And then the later episodes, it was just like so cringy with like the necklace purchase and the talk with Ariana and um, just the interactions that I would have and me just going AWOL and just putting it all out there without thinking, which was very unlike me. That's what I was going to ask. Does it feel like you're watching yourself or is it like out of body? Oh, if I feel like I'm watching myself, but like the worst version of myself. So it's not like I don't own that because that is a part of me. It's just a part that I've never, um, you know, like I, it was new. It was a new experience. And I think part of that, too, and I don't want to make excuses here either. I'm just, you know, learning so much about myself. A lot of that had to do with always being a good girl and, like, doing as I'm told. I was always a rule follower. Um, And once I aged out of pageants and I didn't have that, like, ceiling over me anymore... I just kind of like went wild and just I, also I was coming out of my people pleasing era because there was a lot of pleasing with James, especially in that relationship and a lot of um, holding myself back with my drinking so that he wouldn't be tempted to drink and a lot of monitoring my own behaviors to benefit our relationship which I realize now is codependency. Listen, I get it. I was very much the Catholic school girl. I went from pre-K to eighth, and then I went to an all-girls Catholic high school and graduated. And my first two years away in college, I went buck wild. I made choices that were bad for me. I was in bad relationships. I experienced things I never thought I would experience. I lost that structure and the more freedom that I had, I didn't stop myself. I let go. But I look back at those years as learning experiences and I know my limits. I know what I need to do to be the best version of me. And I have my own moral structures now in my life, which I learned you need to create your own structures and it can change Of course, but it's something you can lean on to be the best version of yourself. And I do hope that she gets there one day as well. Was James your first unhealthy relationship? James was, yeah, James is like my first real, real relationship. And I met James when I was 21. Um, And so, you know, now I'm 29. um, And all of those years have been on a reality TV show. So that's... Or in pageants before that. I think it's important Mm -hmm. to acknowledge that also played a part. Well, yeah, with the pageant life, (laughs) the reason why I got into pageants is because I had such social anxiety um, where I wanted to overcome my fears 
of public speaking. And that's also a big reason why I decided to ultimately do Vanderpump Rules because I knew it would put me outside of my comfort zone. Um, and it has. I mean, look at me now. I have my own podcast. I would never have thought. Um, <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I did. It was very constrained, monitored, um, just in my own mind, like my own expectations of what I thought I should be. And once I let that go, it was like, I don't give a F anymore. Mm. I'm going to do what I want. And I'm not here to please other people. I'm here to please myself. Mm. So it was this selfish era. And um, and it played out on camera. Would you say you've been like insecure your whole life? Or like, what have you thought of yourself? Yeah, I've been insecure my whole life. I've um, I've always been the tallest one in my Mm. class and just awkward, lanky, um, didn't really feel good in my own skin. At the age of like seven, six or seven, I changed my name to Raquel because I ultimately like didn't want to be me in a way. Like I wanted to be something better almost. And so I had this perception of who I was and from a very young age. Um, and yeah. My twenties were definitely my learning era in life. I went through it and learned from all my mistakes. I don't regret it because I also believe it's made me who I am and made me aware of things I never would have been aware of and not vulnerable or naive like I was in my twenties, but she will get there one day. I hope that she can look back and not forget this wasn't all for nothing. It was how she found herself. I feel like, though, she's the type where she wants to be in the spotlight, always has been, but she was shy and she did things to put herself out there. And when she finally got the spotlight put on her, she wasn't this perfect person And she wasn't living up to what people wanted her to be, like this angelic angel. And she freaked out. And now she's trying to fit back into a mold and be something that she isn't. And I don't know what is going to work for her, but I hope she finds herself. That's just something I've always seen in her and what we are now seeing from her. So we will only see what time. You're very guarded. Has anyone ever told you that? Like, just as producers on this show with you, it's hard to break through to you. Yeah. And I sort of wanted to know if you're aware of that, what that is. Yeah. And and were you like that on the show or are you back being like that again now because of everything that happened? That's, yeah. Um, unfortunately, because of everything that has happened, I feel like I have to have these walls up now. And it's hard for me to let people in. Um, And it sucks because I was at that stage in my life before this scandal and before this experience with Tom and the show and everything. Um, Then things got out of hand. And now I feel like because it has become such a talked about scandal, um, it's kind of put me back in that same position not the same position because I'm definitely in a different place but it's that same feeling of like oh I can't let people in and I'm also like walking around thinking like oh does that person you know do they recognize me or do they have like what do they think are they judging me right now um and those are things that I'm working on overcoming what are people saying because you've just started to sort of re-enter the world right like We've brought you out to a few things. You went to Jingle Ball with us. Yeah. What do people say to you? People who recognize me are usually happy to see me and they would usually ask for a photo and just um, there has been this really lovely woman that I met in Chicago actually and she was like, I just really condone what you're doing and like how you're speaking out on your mental health and that's a really tough conversation to have. And she's like, I'm just 
sending you so much encouragement and love. And so it's been very positive, the interactions that I've had. Um, Has anything happened negative? I'll bring up one, but... We'll get to that. What, the David Portnoy. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely getting into that. What, what's going on with that? Let's talk about it. Like, you don't know him, correct? No, I I didn't know how to pronounce his last name until... You never DM'd or anything? No, 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 no. I've heard of Barstool Sports, but I've never heard of Dave Portnoy. And um, it's just kind of wild how that story came out on Explain Thanksgiving. Explain to everyone what happened. Okay, so I was in Chicago visiting my friends. These are friends that I met at my treatment center. Um, So my recovery friends. And I guess I was spotted at a coffee shop and I took a few photos with a few people. And of course, people were speculating and people were saying, oh, well, David Portnoy was in Chicago the same weekend that Raquel was there or Rachel. And it was Halloween weekend, you guys. Like, you, you're thinking way too much into it. But, of course, like, the only rational thing is that <laughs> David Portnoy and I are dating. And that's why he and his girlfriend broke up. Yeah, and I'm, I want to read what he said because I'm okay. curious how this makes you feel. He said, I can confirm I've never met that trash bag in my life. And it's wildly insulting to even be mentioned in the same sentence as her. <laughs> um. You know, I've learned a lot about projection, and I think he doesn't know me at all. Um, So whatever story he's made up in his mind is, I don't know, just it's on him, I think. And also I know that there was, there's a lot of misinformation about me out there too, and I think the reason why he's so polarized to me is because he believes a lie that was put out there. So it's just a little bit quick to judge, which, I mean, that's his style, right? He's a shock jock and um, that's what his fans like. So, yeah. yeah. And do you think that you're able to handle what happened and what was said better now than, say, a year ago? if someone said that about you? Oh, yeah. I've definitely developed thick skin being on Vanderpump Rules. um, And that has been a pro for me because before I was very insecure and I would let people's opinions of me like sway my view of myself. But I know I'm not a trash bag. So if he's saying I'm a trash bag, it's fine. It's just like rolling off my shoulder because it's not true. What would you like to say to him? Um, If he was sitting here right now, what would you say? I don't know. I'm such an avoidant person. I'm like, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be in the same room as him, honestly. Yeah. Fair. Being guarded is not a bad thing. Having a small circle of people you trust is not a bad thing, in my opinion. And I get that She is worried about what people are saying about her. I mean, who wouldn't be? But she also is on a much bigger scale of fame. And she needs to be less caring of what people who don't know her, that judge her based off what is being said and reported, and not care and just live her life knowing that if she is true to herself, she will show her truth for those who care to see it and those who are the ones that matter. Not the ones that don't care to see it. If she lived her life trying to be what everyone wants her to be, she won't be happy. And what lie did David Portnoy believe? People are allowed to think that she's a trash human for what she did. And what she did was have an affair with her best friend's boyfriend. That is not a lie. Regardless of how it happened or if he said the right words to later get her hopes up, she still was trash for doing that, period. He is entitled to feel that way. And was it reaching that people thought that they hooked up and that's why him and his girlfriend broke up? Yes. 
but unfortunately, those are people that don't matter, and she should care less about those things and laugh at the stupidity of those people making these crazy weird theories up like that and just keep living your life and proving them wrong. That's what kills them the most. All right, let's see what else we got. Oh, I have something to say. I'm hesitant to say this too because I don't want to start any beef, but um, I was more disturbed at somebody who made a TikTok about it, like further perpetuating the rumor that Dave Portnoy and I were the reason why he and his girlfriend broke up Mm -hmm. because this is a friend of mine who I've known in high school and I introduced her to our friend group and um, she decided to make a TikTok and say like, I really hope this isn't true. And I felt like commenting saying, Hey, you know, you could have just texted me mm-hmm. if you were that concerned. Do you feel betrayed by a lot of people? Yeah, I do. I do. And it's hard. But it's like I betrayed people too. So I don't know. It's it's a difficult reality to accept. Do you feel that you deserve to be betrayed or mistreated? I don't know if I necessarily deserve to be betrayed. Um, I have really gained a huge appreciation for the friends who have stuck by me through this tough time and haven't spoken publicly, voicing their opinions um, and sharing personal stories. Um, Yeah, it's like at least my eyes are open to who my true friends are because going forward, like this is my whole motto to like attract positive people into my life to create real strong friendships that have true intimacy and develop those so if you know if anything looking on the bright side it's narrowed down my group of people (laughs) yeah I'm assuming you're not friends with the tiktok creator no i i unfollowed her recently and who do you talk to do you talk to anyone from the vanderpump former or current cast members um i it's it's really difficult for me to there are a few people that i do speak to occasionally and that have expressed that they miss me so much and they haven't spoken out publicly like bashing me or anything um but i have these walls up and i know that Vanderpump rules. I mean, the scandal got so out of hand that it became so sensationalized and the ratings were so high. So I know that they were digging and digging for any information that they could get from any of the cast members. Um, So I protected myself and had to take a step back. And I've expressed that to these friends. And I've made it clear that like once you're out of that world um then you know we can have these intimate conversations again we're weeks just a couple weeks from the premiere Mm -hmm. of season 11 how do you feel about that um (laughs) I know it's gonna be a lot for me emotionally but ultimately I feel like no I know that I made the right decision by leaving So whatever shit show goes on on the TV is going to be, it's going to be entertaining, I guess. Um, I suspect that people, I don't know. The thing is there, there always has to be drama and there always has to be a villain. And because I took myself out of that, that equation, it will be interesting to see who they choose as a villain this year. Did you ever think about not watching at all? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I think in my treatment facility, when I finally decided I'm not going back to do the show, or ultimately I was being swayed in that direction, um, we were going over my triggers, and basically you want to avoid the things that trigger you, and then you want to focus on the things that bring you joy, Um, and watching an episode of Vanderpump Rules would be a trigger for me. Yeah. But I feel like I'm still in it. Like, I, I'm not on the show anymore, but I'm still in the midst of this chaos, this drama. Um, 
And now that I'm doing a podcast, I guess I'm <laughs> right. really putting we myself on it. We have to watch it. it. <laughs> but maybe do you think there's any chance that watching it will make you uh, feel good about the decision to leave? I think so. I suspect so. I'm also curious. I mean, if I were in your shoes, I feel like one thing that would be really hard for me is to see my dog on this season. Like, how do you feel about that? That's really hard. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do a podcast to talk about these things like the Graham situation. Do you want to take a minute and sort of talk about the dog? Oh, God, this is a long story. So, <laughs> Another key word I heard her say was that when she was in the treatment facility and she decided she wasn't going to do the show she then said well ultimately I was being swayed in that direction what does she mean by swayed was she swayed by the fact they weren't giving her the money she wanted was she swayed by somebody else or by something else Swayed means you were pushed into that direction, which I feel like she is saying that because she can then later be like, well, they swayed me into not doing it when really she wanted to. I don't know. These keywords she's using are just really something to think about. And I said it when I heard that she was doing a podcast that for someone who says that they want to move on with their lives and they were selling all the things that reminded her of the affair, that by her doing this podcast, she really isn't moving on, especially if she's going to watch VPR and give her takes and her opinions on what is being said with the cast and what's happening. To me, if she wanted to move on, like she claims, a podcast talking about the affair and the show isn't moving on. And that is why I question still, what is she trying to do with her new platform? What do you guys think? Let me know down below. Graham, my mini golden doodle, was gifted to me by my parents for a graduation gift. And the same day I got him was the same day James and I got our own apartment in L.A. Um, and so we raised him together. Ah, Graham, Graham, Graham. Graham is a big personality. He's got a big dog energy and a little dog body. Um, and he's feisty and he's fun. He's sporty. But there's also a side of him where he gets possessive of his objects like bones or balls or anything that he shouldn't be having and he'll switch into an attack mode. Um, and it also doesn't help the situation. And I'm hesitant to say even this because I don't want to put anything out there that's gonna, I don't know. My intentions aren't to bring somebody down, but I feel like it's an important piece in this puzzle. The truth of the matter is James was not a good dog owner in the way that James would taunt Graham and he would just antagonize him. He would kick Graham off of the couch when he was sleeping and not expecting it. So that would shock him. Um, he would encourage Graham to bite his hands and it really reinforced that biting behavior with Graham. And the moments where he did drink too much and he was unhinged and yelling, Graham would hide under the couch. So, and dogs pick up on that kind of energy. So I'm sure that played a part in his behavior. And I would do my best to stop James from tormenting Graham, but I felt myself nagging him. And my mom used to nag when I grew up and I don't want to be like my mom. So I would like nag and nag and then I would stop, but I would express to him that this is really bothering me. But I put him in training. Um, he, we did agility together and I had him in special socialization training after James and I broke up. But Graham has bitten a few people, um, and 
my parents were taking care of Graham for me while I was at the Meadows. So one day I got a phone call from my mom and she was in a panic on the phone. She said that she's on her way to the emergency room because Graham bit her and she has a gash on her finger where the doctor said he couldn't even stitch it up. It was just like a chunk of flesh missing. Um, and he recommended that we put the dog down and I didn't want that. Um, I was already inquiring about different foster families to watch over Graham, but the ones that did take him in said it wasn't a good fit. So I had the really difficult decision to either leave the meadows and take care of my dog or stay and extend my stay because I knew I had more work that needed to be done because I was still talking to Tom every single day. <laughs> so my family found a breed-specific golden doodle rescue in Southern California, and my dad drove him over there. And my mom had the trainer's phone number, and they promised to keep the rescue adoption situation under wraps because I was a public figure. My mom made it very clear. She didn't say who I was, but she said that I've been in the media lately and we would like to keep this confidential. So they promised to do that. And so I guess they had Graham adopted out to a new owner. The owner returned Graham in three days because he bit him. And then they needed more money for a new trainer because the trainer that was working with him didn't want to work with him anymore. Um, and so they scanned his microchip, saw that it was me registered wow. with the dog, and they decided to contact Vanderpump Dogs. And so Lisa Vanderpump was notified that this golden doodle rescue had graham cracker. And she was like, I, th I think they were asking for a donation, but she was like, oh, oh, I'll adopt graham cracker, you know? And so, <laughs> so she adopts him and then, you know, doesn't tell me or anybody, keeps it a secret because we all know, like sh her first priority is the storyline. Um, I hate to be the one to say this, but who James was when he was with Rachel is not who he is with Allie. Just like James was not the same James he was when he dated Kristen. James himself has learned from his mistakes and grown from all that he has gone through as well. And Allie, in my opinion, has made James an overall well-rounded, much different guy. And I'm there for his growth, just like I am there for hers. And this whole Graham, aka a hippie situation, I don't think necessarily she was a good pet owner. And even after James, if there were things that Graham did that weren't right, whether James used to do something or not, it was her responsibility to take care of him, get him trained, get him readjusted, and get him the help for those issues that he had. But instead, I see her using all of that as an excuse to why she couldn't handle him. And she putting all of that blame onto James. Training takes time. She claims that she did training with him, but I don't think she really focused on it. Because, uh, let's be honest, she was focused on someone else at that time, Tom. Training isn't a one and done kind of thing. And her parents also should have wanted to try and get help for Graham, knowing that before the point of them taking him in, he had issues. But that's my opinion. And I don't think that necessarily James was a great pet owner back when he was with Rachel either. But I think he is different now that he's with Allie. And I saw that when he got Hippie back and they both went above and beyond to get him readjusted, get him trained more properly, and that shows growth. I think it's going to be extremely hard for her to see a pet that she loved on a show, but I do hope that she can see the growth that Hippie has made and that James is taking care of him well.
Now, let me say this. The micro trip thing exists to be able to identify these animals, its ownership, and where the dog came from, when it was microchipped, all of that information. And a place like Vanderpump Dogs that had him at one time, they're going to reach out. And I think that they thought that maybe they would be able to get this animal a home or a donation, anything to kind of make it more comfortable for him or get more time to be able to find a home for him. I don't think Lisa or Vanderpump Dogs were even obligated to tell Rachel that they adopted him back. It was no longer her dog at that point. And I don't think it was done with malice intent towards her. And I hate to say it, but eventually it would have gotten out regardless because people would have asked, where's Graham? What about Graham? Didn't she have a dog? I do think that Rachel and her family were the ones that didn't want this to come out because it looked bad and it still looks bad. And I know as an animal lover and owner myself, I will do anything and everything for my pet no matter what. I think the best option, whether she sees it, is that Graham is back with James. And I hope that she can understand that he's being well taken care of, he's loved, and not hold any resentment towards James or Allie, but just be happy to see that he is where he is and he's in a better spot than where she couldn't handle it at that time. What do you guys think? Let me know down below. And how'd you find out? Okay, so I found out. So I was one week after my 90-day stay at this facility, I was out. Basically, we were trying to come to an agreement and negotiations to get me back to do Vanderpump yeah. Rules. They were really trying to get me to sign to do Vanderpump Rules before the cast trip to Lake Tahoe because that's oh, when they yeah. wanted me to re-enter. Ultimately, I said, whichever way you put it, I can't physically, I physically can't go back because it wouldn't be good for me. And so they said, fine, it's over. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> and then um, the next week, my mom and I are sitting on the bed and we're looking at Instagram and it was a fan that posted, Graham, is that you mm -hmm. in Lake Tahoe? And I was like, my heart oh. sank. And I was like, mom, there's no way that Graham would be back mm. on the show, right? Like, that just doesn't make sense. And she's like, oh, I don't know. Like, let me call the, the trainer and let me call the foster. And the foster told us, like, oh, isn't it great? Lisa Vanderpump adopted Graham. Oh, man. She said that if she can't rehome him, that he'll live out the rest of his days on her ranch. And my mom and I are like, ranch? Like, she doesn't have a ranch. So Graham's back on the show, and you don't have Graham, but they have Graham, and yeah. they're filming with Graham, which I, I know sounds crazy we're talking about Graham, but... <laughs> I surrendered all rights to Graham when I gave him to the rescue to be rehomed with a good family who's experienced with dogs who have aggressive behavior. <laughs> and Lisa goes and adopts him, takes him to Lake Tahoe and surprises James with Graham saying, James, well, I can only imagine, but basically the story that they put out there is Lisa told everyone that I surrendered my dog at a kill shelter and he was hours away of being euthanized. Yeah, so this was what was in the press. Yes. So I know that that's the story. That's the storyline that they're going to push for season 11 when yeah. Graham comes into the picture. Oh, wow. Um, and I'm sure James, like, to say that, obviously the goal is to get a reaction, right? Yeah. And James is a very reactive person. So I could only imagine, like, what his thought process is. And then it's, like, to drop this dog on you and not even like console your girlfriend to see like what's you know like it was very like spur the moment and to think about I was only a week out of my treatment and their whole plan was to get me to Tahoe so that they could drop this bomb on me crazy I told Lisa I you spoke to her yeah I I texted her saying I don't support Graham being with James. He needs to be with an owner who knows how to work with troubled dogs. Um, and 
I won't go into the specifics of why I don't think James is a worthy dog owner, but this is, you know, like I would not live with myself if I didn't express these concerns and something were to happen. And so she called me and I expressed my thoughts, but her concerns more lied with me coming back to do the show. And she said, well, darling, why don't you just come to the La Rosa and bring me some flowers and explain why you left Sir so abruptly without notice and apologize. And then you can explain your side of the story. And it was like, wait, what? And almost, you know, like it almost got me because I was like, well, I do want to explain my side of the story. Like, yeah. this is an important thing. Like, this is my child that's being drawn into this mix. And I feel like they were almost using him as bait, perhaps. I don't know. But it definitely has been a thought that has crossed my mind, trying to get me to come back and explain myself. But I realized that if I were to explain the real story, they wouldn't air it. Again, when you relinquish all your rights, there is no way for you to be like, well, this isn't the home I want him to go to. You have no right after that. And in my opinion, these are all just her assumptions and we will definitely be seeing more in season 11. But I don't think just because she was once an owner that she has any right to be like, well, he shouldn't be on the show or Lisa should never have adopted him or that Lisa should have called her to tell her or who she even thinks the dog should go to. Like, she has no rights after that. And again, I think Hippie is in a loving home. He has training that he's been doing and continues to go through from everything I've seen and read. And we will all get to see too. I believe he is in a loving home and that he's being well taken care of. And that's all we can ask for this dog. And I'll say this too. Because the tabloids said this is how it happened doesn't mean it did. I don't believe it's even the storyline that Bravo and VPR were pushing. It was at that point assumptions being made by everyone from what they were seeing. And I do believe she is still making assumptions now about how it all went down. I do know too from what other shows during their filming and news being broken that what we hear then is not always what we see and how it goes down. So we will just all have to wait and see there. And I don't think that they were trying to get Rachel to Lake Tahoe to drop this bomb on her. I think these are all assumptions, again, that she is making. And I'll say this. For Lisa to want to hear her out and give her a chance to explain to her what happened, in theory, yes, is a good business move period. I do think that they would have tried to get her story out, but it's also not up to Lisa or any of them how it is put out there. And that is just how reality television works. And here we go. Keyword time. She said, I do want to tell my side of the story. This is an important thing. This is my child that's being drawn into the mix. Now, I don't know about you, but yes, my pet is my child. But there is a big difference between a child and a pet. And someone using someone's actual child as bait is horrible. And yes, not something that people take too lightly. And I think, again, the way she words things and how she's putting things is very interesting and I really feel like she is using these keywords to make a situation more traumatic more dramatic for her story and not lie and say it doesn't bother me because it does and her nervous laugh bothers me too and I just don't understand these keywords what do you guys think Right. I mean, because, we're, look, we're just one hour into this podcast and we've barely touched all of it. Yeah. And so I don't know that it would have been possible 
to convey it on an edited television show where you had three minutes in a scene. That's very true. And that's a good point of view from a producer standpoint, which I think is accurate. But then as a storyline standpoint, I know that James is now the number one guy in the group by process of elimination. So by... Explain that to a layman like myself. Explain what that means. So there's a famous line that Mm -hmm. Jax Taylor said a while back on Vanderpump Rules saying that he's the number one guy in the group. And so since Jax didn't come back for the remainder of the seasons... It was like, now who's the number one guy in the group? And a lot of people were saying it was Tom Sandoval. Um, And now that Tom Sandoval isn't the number one guy in the group, now it's between Schwartz and James Kennedy. And so (laughs) by process of elimination, James Kennedy is the number one guy in the group. Interesting. So speaking of Tom Sandoval, we wanted to play for you, again, with your permission, some things that Tom recently said. Yeah, let's hear it. Do you miss her? Yes, of course I do. We were best friends. So you have no relationship whatsoever, no, no communication? No, and, and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to go through. So you were in it. Yes, yeah. I was See, that's fully the part. in I didn't, love with I her. I believe she was that. just the excuse. Yeah. I thought she was the excuse It's not get just out some of- hot girl, like... Come on, I was I, I was a model for like 15 years. Like it's it's deeper than that. It's more than that. Uh the arrogance of it all. I was a model. I was a model for 14 years. What is he talking about? Um what is he talking about? Uh honestly, I kind of zoned that one out because I've I've listened to this podcast interview um maybe like five times now. I prost I, I sent it to my therapist. Um, when I heard just a little snippet on Instagram, someone was promoting and I heard what he was saying just in that snippet. I was like, oh, I feel sick. And like funny sick or actually sick? No, sick. like sick, sick. Oh, man. And then I've never had this physical reaction before, but my I felt like I was going to throw up like because his voice repulsed me. And. I'm like, okay, this is a good sign. Like, <laughs> wow. So hearing him say that he missed you, it doesn't bring up any feelings at all? No, because, well, it's a complicated question because there is that part of me that like wants to believe in that fantasy. Yep. And I miss that, yeah. But in living in reality, um, no, like because he misses all of the benefits of our relationship without – actually being in a relationship and also having a committed relationship. Does it feel vindicating at all that he's publicly saying that? Oh, yes, it does. (laughs) No, and I know that he was kind of like playing the offensive because I'm coming out with my own podcast and he's afraid of ah, what I'm going to say. Um, So I know that he's like really trying to milk the victim role to make himself look better, I think, but in reality, I think it's making him look worse. I mean, that's what, I mean, I've been reading. Normally, I'm staying away from all of this stuff. Yeah, I'm like, surprised even, you're like listening and reading about but all this. But this one, this one got me. Yeah, I bet. Mm-hmm. And why that, did this stand out? I'm just curious compared to all the other stuff he said and done about you. This one is, this one stood out because it seemed like he really did flip on me. And he really threw me under the bus and he was okay with it. And it seemed like he was doing a lot of victim blaming and not taking accountability and owning it and maybe standing up for me a little bit. Like if you really did love me and care about me the way that you say you did, I think he would probably not say something like that. I also want to say he said that you made the first move. Is that true? We can get into it. It's not. I got nothing but time. (laughs) I don't think she would have gotten her story out there even throughout the entire season 11 if she had gone back. I don't think there is enough time. And there are multiple castmates that have their own stories to tell too. And if this is the best way for her to get her story out, then so be it. They all have done this. 
James Kennedy, too, like, her, like, being mad that he's, like, the number one guy in the group, I think at this point in time and where they all are in life, James is the one showing the most growth and is doing well, and she can be mad all she wants that he's the number one guy just because it's her ex, but he has literally shown the most growth out of all of them. I think personally, both her and Tom have been trying to victim blame since they stopped, per se, talking to each other. I think that Tom does, in fact, miss Rachel and their friendship. Like he has said that he has missed parts of Ariana and their relationship. I think that will always be true. I do agree, though, that he liked the benefit of Rachel and their relationship being hidden and having all those benefits without it being out there. And that is something he has to deal with and work on, just like she has had to come to terms with allowing it and working on what to know for future relationships. And can we be honest? Rachel and Tom have both milked this victim role and have tried to take the real victim out of the spotlight which is Ariana, by trying to be the victim when it comes to what each other of them have done and what they did, all of that. Rachel, I do think, needed the mental health help, and I do feel like she went away to run away from her problems, but also a way to try and understand them too. I know that Allowing that door to open because people don't understand mental health is also another benefit to her so that she can look like a victim more than she actually is with certain situations. And that to me is not right. For her to say, well, if he really loved me, he would have stood up for me more. Well, that could be said about Ariana too, who he was in a much longer relationship with than Rachel. But for Tom... Tom has always been about himself and what looks best for him. He has issues that need to be worked on. And personally, I think that he had issues with Kristen like he did with Ariana. He did show some growth in the relationship, but he resorted back to what he knew. But anyways, these are my thoughts. What are your thoughts? Let me know down below. We have a little bit more to go, so let's get through this. I could tell you the story. Ooh. We're happy to hear it. And then you can decide who made the first move because I'm not accusing anyone. I think it was like, you know, day a day or two after Guy's Night, which was a day or two after this girl's trip to Vegas. But which this was all on the show. This is all on the show. Yeah. This is like episode three or four or something like that. Okay. So basically, I'm filming a scene at Sir with Lisa and I'm telling her how I'm standing up for myself and I'm not allowing these girls to pick on me anymore and I'm not going to let them bully me and I'm stand I'm coming into my own. He knew that I was at Sir um filming and so he came by Sir and he got me a drink at the bar like my special drink that I like with the strawberries and whatever. Um and we were like, okay, cool. Like, let's go to beaches with the group afterwards, which is around the corner from Sir in West Hollywood. And before we left Sir, we had a little conversation on the patio, just the two of us. And were you best friends at this, that point? At or this point, good no. friends. Were you sexually point, attracted? We were <laughs> well. Then though, because sometimes then, people can grow on you. Yeah. I think then I was starting to feel a certain way. Got it. Mm -hmm. And the tension he would give me and just like the, you know, like, uh, it just felt, it we felt may be good in digging into love bombing later, but yeah. we shall. Yeah. Okay. Cue the love bombing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, so he's like, oh, let's let's not go to beaches. Let's go to the Abbey instead. And I'm like, okay. So we get a drink at the Abbey. And I was like, do you need a ride home? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I'll drive you home. So we get to his house and we're like. Cameras or no cameras? No cameras. Okay, no cameras, got it. No cameras. 
So we get to his house and we're like sitting in my car just chatting for 20 minutes. And then he's like, do you like want to come in for a nightcap? And I was like, oh, twist my arm. Why don't you? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. So then we go to the front door and he's apparently locked out because he left his key in there. Um, and this is the house he lives with Ariana. Yeah, where is she? Correct. Uh, she's sleeping <gasps> upstairs. Um, so he's like, oh, I'm locked out. Let, let me try the back door. Like, come with me around back. And I was like, okay, cool. So we go in the back. Oh, no. And the sliding door isn't unlocked. So he's like, well, we've got the fire pit here. And I was like, yeah, the fire pit's cool. Like we could just keep talking. So we've got the fire pit going and we're chatting. And then he goes, he says, um, do you know what the best thing about this pool is? And I was like, what? And he's like, that it's heated. Oh no. And I was like, should we go in? And he's why is like, this on camera? It's be so <laughs> juicy. Okay. It's like, um, he was like, well, I don't know. And I was like, well, do you have towels? He's like, yeah, I have towels in the side, in the side of the house. And I was like, okay, then I'm going to go in. So I like took my jeans off and I had this like corset top on. So I left that on and I was in my underwear and I went in his pool and it was heated. Um, so what did he wear? <laughs> oh, no. Huh? I don't know if I want to know the answer. Oh, my um, God. Just his boxers. Okay. Thank God. Okay. So then what? Okay. So then, you know, I'm swimming around in the shallow side of the pool. And then he's swimming around in the deep end. And I have my little, my phone is playing music over here. And he was like, he like came swimming over to me and he's like, turn that down. And I was like, okay, I turned it down. And then he, and then he like looked at me a certain way. And then he like grabbed me, oh. spun me and kissed me. And I was like surprised, but like happy. Oh God. So bad. So embarrassing. Many people have been in, you're not the only person that's ever been in this situation which we will dig into in further episode. I think what's blowing my mind too is like all this is happening. There aren't cameras. So this show is very real. Like these relationships I know. are real. And I think, I, you know, like that's the part too that I think maybe fans were disappointed about because they didn't get to see it play out in real time. Well, they but can listen here. I knew, I mean, I knew it was wrong. Tom knew it was wrong because he You're didn't You're sort of caught want... up in this moment, right? Well, yeah, because, you know, right after Tom kissed me, he, like, sat on the stair of the pool um, one step in, and he was, like, hands on his face, like, like his mind must have been running a million miles a minute, like, contemplating what to do. Um, and I was like, uh... You know, like, I should go. Oh, wow. You know, so I got my towel. I dried off. I got my pants on. And he was like, no, 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 no. Don't go. Don't go. Just sit down. So we, we moved to, like, the fire pit, the couch on the by the fire pit. And um, he was like, hang on. Like, I just need to think for a second. Like, I, you know, like, I just don't know what to do right now because I, like, really like you. But, you know. Oh, my goodness. Um, and I was like, okay, I was like, well, I feel weird sitting here. Like, would you rather like go talk about this in my car? And he was like, oh, yeah. No. So we go to my car. All why Ariana was sleeping upstairs, which she knew and Rachel knew they were together and she didn't stop it. She didn't think twice about it. She didn't think, what if we get caught? Like, I know alcohol was involved, but I just don't get it personally. Because I could never, I would never, and have never. Even these two iHeart Radio podcast women were like, um, I don't want to hear this. Because they could tell it was going too far. They kiss, and she even describes him sitting there trying to figure out what just happened, what he is feeling. Why didn't she stop and think, 
this is my friend's boyfriend. What am I doing? But instead, she just feels weird because let's be real. They are out in the open at his house in his backyard. So let's go to the car instead. So let's go to the car and hear what happens. Well, what happened in there? Did you hook up? Yeah, we did. Everything? Uh, it was very it was very bad. Like, why is he saying this? I think he's just trying to spin the narrative. Got it. Even as just sort of a innocent bystander here, it's blurry. Like they both they, they they Yeah, did. it seemed like nobody's right, nobody's wrong in who made the first move. Uh, right. Does it even matter it doesn't who matter. made the first move? It's like who cares? Because it was like, I feel like I'm in I'm in this like romantic like I feel swept off my feet yeah, like yeah. I feel so infatuated and, and like loved and then it's like oh no like yeah. oh, I'm now hanging out with Ariana and a group of people and I just feel with like, cameras with cameras you add cameras yeah. to it it's and then like... you know like I'm drinking more because I'm feeling uncomfortable and it got to a point where my friends were like my friend pulled me aside one night at Schwartz and Sandy's because we were all there and I was <laughs> drinking a lot. Um, and he was like, what's going on, Raquel? Like, what is going on? And I was like, I don't know if I can tell you. I don't think I should tell you. And he's Who said like, that? Me. Who were you talking to? Oh, my friend. Okay, got it. He was like, what has, what's been going on? Because we haven't been hanging out like we normally would. And, and I would come up with like these excuses as to mm. where I was and what I was doing. Like I'm, you know, getting my teaching credentials for Pilates. Like I'm looking into it, you know, like it wasn't yeah, yeah, even yeah. like a real thing. Um, and he's like, I just feel like you're not okay. And I was like, I'm not okay. And he's like, I want you to tell me. And I was like, I want to tell you too, but I'm really drunk right now and I can't tell you right now, but like, like let's talk tomorrow. And so I went home, slept and he called me in the morning and he was like, okay, so what's going on? And I was like, oh man, I was hoping you wouldn't remember. <laughs> and he was like, no, just tell me it's fine. And I was like, okay, um, you know, Tom and I have been seeing each other and, um, this has been going on for a few months and mm. like, I really love him. Like I have these strong feelings for him. And he was like, Raquel, this is not good. Like, what about Ariana? And I was like, I know, like, I, I know, like, this is why I'm like drinking and like, mm, like not well. And he was like, I don't condone this behavior at all. Like I don't stand by this but I want to be a friend for you, but I don't agree with this. And I think you need to end things. And I was like, you're probably right. Um, I was like, okay, noted. Thank you for listening and not being judgmental and, um, being there for me. Um, and so, you know, I, I knew I needed to end it and I would try to end it. Yeah. But then he would always find a way to get back in my life. I guess it gives us a lot to talk about. How do you feel? My mouth is dry. <laughs> no, I feel good. It feels good to tell these stories because these are the stories that I've been telling my family mm -hmm. and my close friends. And and it's like, this is my crazy life. Like, this is what I got myself into. And I know there's like a part where... The producers weren't happy with me because it's a reality TV show, right? Like, it should be They're reality. But, like, you know, it was our secret. Oh, and I see. Oh, they weren't, they wanted all this. Yeah, to be they wanted it to all be on camera. Of course. Right. And instead, I was, you know, Schwartz was a convenient cover up in a way. And we'll get into we'll Schwartz, get into yeah. too. And we'll get into boundaries and love bombing. And oh, so much. Real, real quick, though, I want to know what fears you have of doing this podcast. Um, I think my biggest fear is that I'm not going to be portrayed the way that I feel like is true to me. And maybe I have that fear because 
I don't know, my experience with Vanderpump Rules. And I know like, you know, there's a there's an algorithm. This is the entertainment industry. Like we want this to be a salacious podcast for the views that gets like the ratings and all the stuff. I just don't want to, I know I'm in a vulnerable place, so I don't want to get too overboard in that direction because that's not really true to who I am. Also, like there's NDAs that are signed with a contract when you film a show like this where you can't disclose storyline information. Um, and I feel pretty secure in myself that, well, unfortunately, because this Tom Sandoval situation wasn't really a storyline right. for all of the season, it was my actual life. I feel comfortable talking mm -hmm. about those things. Yeah. But then when we go into the realities of reality TV, I feel like that's where it gets a little bit risky. So it feels really good to get these stories off of my chest. And I know that I would just be like spinning around in circles if I remained quiet and didn't get my story across. So I thank you guys for listening and Part of the reason why I'm drawn to do a podcast and talk about these specific concepts of like when you put somebody on a pedestal and there's a power imbalance and issues with codependency and molding yourself to shape someone else's perception of you and getting caught up in those very vulnerable personal things that I've experienced is because I know that there's other people out there that struggle with those things too. And I'm not the first person to be involved in a relationship that wasn't handled correctly. Um, so my story is not unique in that. Mine's just broadcasted to a much, much larger scale. Well, that's the end of the podcast. Let me get my final thoughts out there. I agree. It is a very blurry situation on who made the first move. And it's not right regardless. And I think they're still both at fault. They both could have stopped it. They both made the choice to continue even after the first kiss. And that is what led to happen. She says that's when she started drinking more because she felt so uncomfortable, yet she attributed her drinking to the show. And this is what kind of gets me because when she was on Bethany Frankel, she said it was the show that attributed to her drinking more. And the reality is it was her actions and what she did that made her start drinking more because she knew it was wrong. She knew it was awkward. She continued it to, though she, yes, might have been not in the right headspace, but those are all her actions. No one else's but hers. And that's where I feel like she has been trying to push the blame of things onto others when it's clear to see the only one to blame was herself and her wrong choices. And I don't see much ownership to things, especially those damn keywords that she used to make situations more traumatic and dramatic than they really are. In my opinion, her friend that she ended up coming clean to and told about her feelings towards Tom and what was happening was, again, another moment she had to be like, you're right, and she should have then done something then to stop it all. I think he was being a great friend, and though he didn't condone what she was doing, he still wanted to be her friend and help her because he could see what she was doing was destruction to herself. And unfortunately, when someone's actions show that they don't want to change, there isn't much more that that friend can do to help. And she was more wrapped up with this infatuation than the reality of it all. And that moment was a moment. And she should have come back and really looked at it for what it was 
but she chose not to. I'm glad that she's getting her story out there. There are some things that, to me, seem very exaggerated, and that does happen when people tell stories from months prior. Their memories change. Their ideas of the situations change. It's bound to happen. I think this is going to be an interesting podcast for Rachel, and... I will be covering it as much as we can all tolerate it. If you guys want to hear it, I will sit through it and listen to it and give my opinions like I did, but I can't also sit back and let her just say these things and push the blame onto others when she needs to take more accountability for her actions. That's like step number one on trying to fix yourself and to better yourself. And I think she just needs to take a little bit more accountability for what really went down. What do you guys think of this podcast? What do you feel about her coming out with everything? Are you interested to hear more? Can you wait? Can't wait for next week? Or like, are you done? You don't want to hear anything else? Let me know down below in the comments. Also, make sure to subscribe to my channel for all the amazing other content that I will be bringing to you as well. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I will see you again soon. Bye, everyone. With the pretty on your arm once you cover up my bruises and battle scars but it always ends the same can't bear the things i've had to face got you crying on your knees in pain oh some things never change never change oh you